Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasts. Content warning ahead. This podcast contains very sensitive topics such as missing persons, unsolved cases, haunted houses, and paranormal activity. These type of topics can contain very upsetting, sensitive details and stories. Please listen responsibly. Welcome to Misty Mysteries, a podcast in the business of ghostly spooks and chilling crimes. I'm your host, Keely, and this is my first episode back from break. I'm so excited to be here hosting and telling you all about third man syndrome. This is a topic that I think at first it feels like you know nothing about, but as you hear the stories, you realize how much it's sort of just been in uh, TV, movies, books, and even throughout paranormal stories throughout time. The story of the third man syndrome starts with an Irish Antarctic explorer named Sir Ernest Henry Shackleton. Sir Ernest led three expeditions to Antarctica for the British. The first, the Discovery Expedition from 1901 to 1904. The second, the Nimrod Expedition from 1907 to 1909. These were considered successful, but now Shackleton wanted to be the first to cross the entire continent of Antarctica. How was he going to do this? With two ships and two crews, the first ship he named the Endurance was going to leave from South Georgia, an island in Antarctica, to the Vahassel Bay, where they would then make the 1,800-mile journey across the lands to a second ship named Aurora who would be waiting at the McMortar Sound with additional supplies and supply caches they set up along the last stretch of this journey since they would be running out of supplies towards the end of this 1,800-mile journey across Antarctica. But this expedition did not go as planned. On the overcast snowy morning of December 5th, 1914, Shackleton, with a crew of 27 men, including one stowaway who later joined the crew as a stew, 69 dogs, and a tomcat named Miss Chippy, set sail from South Georgia. Very quickly, Shackleton noticed that a lot sooner than he thought he would have to, he was moving the endurance through water with fast-moving ice. As they pushed on, the ship began to get stuck in dense, thick ice, slowing the crew down for days at a time. And on the days they could move, often only getting about 30 miles of movement towards their location. By January 15, 1915, the Endurance and its crew was only 200 miles away from its destination to only get stuck again. When they finally got unstuck, they only got a little bit of a ways until January 18th, when they got stuck again, and this time it changed the expedition in a major way. When they woke up the next morning, the Endurance was surrounded by thick ice. Throughout January and February, the crew worked on the ice when cracks would appear in effort to free the Endurance, but ultimately the decision was made to save the crew's efforts and move with the ice. This was something ships and their crews have done before, so Shackleton was sure they could do it too. Wintering in the Endurance, drifting in the ice, the crew left its normal routine behind, using this time to try and keep spirits up celebrating what they could while maintaining their supplies and listening to a crew member play his banjo. The dogs and the tomcat Miss Chippy also played a huge role in keeping up the crew's spirits during the long winter, especially in the month of July when they lived without any sunlight and through bad storms. October brought some hope when the Endurance was freed from the ice and it began to float in water for the first time in 10 months. Unfortunately for the crew living aboard the Endurance, this was short-lived. When the ice came back in, pushing the ship at a 30-degree angle, a mix of this angle and the damage the Endurance had taken from ice over the months, it quickly began to take on water. All crew was told to abandon ship, taking only two pounds of personal items, except for two important additional things. The pictures and film reels that had been taken over the months and the banjo for entertainment. This is sad to say, and I normally avoid anything to do with animals for this reason, but at this time, the decision had to be made to send some of the animals who they saw would have trouble surviving in the cold wild of Antarctica over the Rainbow Bridge, including Miss Chippy. 
Sadly, by the end of all of this expedition, all of the 69 dogs and Miss Chippy crossed over the Rainbow Bridge, hopefully to a warmer and better place. If you want more formal information on what happened to the animals of the Endurance, my sources definitely have some of that, but for Missy Mysteries, we'll only be talking about the crew and their survival. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. We are Mountain Murders, an Appalachian true crime podcast dropping weekly episodes every Sunday. Our show offers well-researched cases with unique storytelling and southern flavor. Stories so good you'll want to sop them up with a biscuit. Ooh, I pull back the curtain on lesser known and often obscure regional cases from Georgia to Maine, exploring the darkness that lurks deep in the heart of Appalachia. And I react with profound statements. <laughs> you mean profoundly stupid statements. <laughs> Something like that. We're not your stereotypical hillbillies. But we do like moonshine. It'll tickle your inyards. Join us every Wednesday for Mountain Murders Offbeat. Offbeat is a mini episode covering a variety of topics from true crime to conspiracy theories, the paranormal and Appalachian centric subjects. Find Mountain Murders anywhere you download podcasts. Hit subscribe today to catch up on our latest episodes or binge our catalog. After the Endurance took on water, the crew set up what they called the Ocean Camp and attempted to recover some supplies despite the dangers of trying to get supplies from a basically sinking ship. They abandoned ship in October, but it wasn't until November 21st, 1915 that Endurance was lost to the cold, iced over water of Antarctica, where it remained lost until it was discovered by a crew of scientists and explorers on March 9th, 2022. As for the crew of Endurance, when Endurance finally sank on November 21st, they decided to set up a new camp they called Patience, where they survived off seal meat. Here, they survived until April of 1916, till the storms and winds pushed the crew to launch the two lifeboats they saved from Endurance and make their way to Elephant Island. On April 9th, the crew made it to Elephant Island after only a few days of sailing in lifeboats. This is where they all set foot on actual land for the first time in 497 days. Which is kind of crazy to think the ice was not only so thick that it sunk the endurance, but they set up camp and lived on it for months. Even more crazy is how close everything actually was, but the ice and the storms made it truly feel so distant. Now, as happy as they were to be on land in such a long time, Shackleton knew that they needed to get to an area with people, which Elephant Island didn't have. So on April 24th, Shackleton took five crew members with him on their best lifeboat and made their way to South Georgia, where they landed after two weeks and 800 miles of dangerous watery conditions on May 8th. Here they rested for a week, and then Sir Ernest Shackleton, Frank Worsley, and Tom Crean hiked 36 hours over mountains and glaciers, where they finally reached a whaling station on May 20th, 1916. At the whaling station, they found people and help was sent to get the rest of Shackleton's crew. After four attempts to rescue the crew in August of 1916, three months after Shackleton got help, all 28 members had been rescued from this nightmare of an expedition. To put that in perspective, they left from South Georgia, the island, on December 5th, 1914, with 28 men 69 dogs and a cat. They were all rescued in August of 1916. That's a long time to be surviving, and only the men survived. Some came close to death, but they survived. That was the end of the Endurance and its cruise expedition, but this is actually only the beginning of our topic, which seems wild, but the story of the Endurance is an important part of the third man syndrome theory. This is because in 1919, Sir Ernest Shackleton wrote a book called South, where he talks about his experiences during this expedition. During his book, he talks about this feeling during their 36-hour hike that instead of three men on the hike during the whole hike, it felt like they were accompanied by a fourth man. 
This is a feeling common to those in traumatic life or death situations, most commonly to specific groups of people like mountain climbers, polar explorers, and shipwreck survivors. We know this now as a third man syndrome, but it didn't get its name until 1922 when a poet named T.S. Eliot wrote a poem called The Wasteland. From line 359 to 365, it read, Who is the third who walks always beside you? When I count, there is only you and I together. But when I look ahead up the white road, there is always another one walking beside you, gliding wrapped in a brown mantle hooded. I do not know whether a man or a woman, but who is that on the other side of you? T.S. Eliot's poem was in reference to this feeling Shackleton wrote about in his own book, and though Shackleton felt a fourth person on his hike, because of the use of third in the poem, it became the third man syndrome. The third man syndrome has probably been around since before Sir Shackleton's book, and there were mentions of it throughout history like with T. Eliot's poem or a 1988 book called Touching the Void by mountain climber Joe Simpson, where he explains his own third man syndrome experience. When climbing the Peruvian Andes, he describes hearing a voice telling him to crawl back down to base after a horrible fall causing him a leg injury. But the third man syndrome was made popular in 2009 when John G. Jeeger wrote a book called The Third Man Factor where he shared stories of these experiences. Every book that I mentioned in this episode, I will find and share links for them so you can read them yourself. But first, I'm going to read to you stories of third man syndrome that will leave you wondering what this phantom feeling truly is. Our first story is the survival of a doctor named Jim Savagey. In 1983, he was doing a climb with a climbing partner named Rick in the Alpines. I'm actually going to play the TikTok I watched it from so you can hear the story from the survivor himself. Alpine route in the spring of 1983, we were avalanched off the route. Um, we fell some 600 meters to the bottom and I was um, unconscious for some period of time. When I woke up, I wasn't sure where I was. When I finally figured out where I was, I went over to Rick and he was dead and, and I realized that I was, I had broken, I didn't realize I'd broken the bones, but I'd broken many of the bones in my body, internal injuries. I was blind everywhere and I realized where I was and I, and I knew the chance of living was very slim and I was hypothermic. And so I effectively just laid down knowing that death was near and it would be an easier way to go. And about the time that I began to get comfortable and warmer, there was essentially a voice over my right shoulder, which said, no, you have to try. You, you can't die. And at that point, from then on, for the whole, the entire day, this voice just gave me instructions. It was a presence. I could feel it over my right shoulder, but I never could. There was no uh, images or no discussion. And it gave me information like, get that down coat, get that water bottle. And then as we moved across the valley, I would fall down and into the snow and the voice would just say, okay, now make these arrows from blood from your face. And I would make these arrows from blood. And the voice would say, in case someone skis by, they'll see you. For most of the day, we went across the valley. And it was a constant companion. We got to the valley where we had spent the night before and, and with a sleeping bag and a stove for it. So I got there and I realized very quickly that I wouldn't be able to get in a sleeping bag because of the injuries. And I wouldn't be able to light the stove and that there was very little I could do. So I was sitting there just more or less waiting for the sun to go down, knowing that, that I would probably be dead in a few hours. But the voice was with me. It was, it was a companion. It was, I was never, I was never scared. I was just there with this, with, with the voice. And so I was sitting there late in the afternoon and I thought I saw some skiers go by. So the voice asked me to call out. So I called out and I said, help. I'd been in an avalanche. And then as I was sitting there, the skiers were gone and, and the voice left. And I thought, well, that's it. The voice knew that I was dead and left me. But as it turns out, these skiers actually, they came up and they asked me if I needed help. And I know now that this voice left because I knew I was safe. I don't think I would have been able to do what I did without that help. Jim shares a story believing without this voice, he would have never made it out alive. Just like 
Jim, the Reddit user Unremarkable Student, shared their own story, writing in response to a post about third man syndrome, saying, My mom had something unusual like this happen twice in her life. First time she was driving on a dirt road and she swore someone told her to put her seatbelt on, which she rarely ever did in her younger years living in a very unpopulated area. Anyways, an animal jumped out in front of her and she ended up in a head-on collision with a tree. She lost her two front teeth and totaled the car, but the voice telling her to buckle up saved her life. The second event was, before her death, she kept mentioning she wouldn't be around much longer and in particular would say she was going to die in her workplace. I honestly thought she was being silly and dramatic. However, unbeknownst to me, she started journaling everything from passcodes for the bank and accounts to note for my future pregnant self. She left little notes in my favorite books in the few months leading up to her death. She ended up having a ruptured left ventricle and died at her workplace a month after turning 60. This inspired me to ask my own mom about her experience because I remember her talking about one growing up and this is what she shared with me. In the accident when Michael died, the camper part I was in landed in a position where the only exit was up against an overpass. I had to find my way out of the camper and swim underwater under the concrete. I almost gave up when someone took my hand and guided me out. When I came out of the water, no one was anywhere near me. My aunt told my Aunt Susan that she got all the kids out, but she was lying on the embankment when I came out of the water, yelling at me to get Jesse because he couldn't swim. I remember as a kid hearing that story and always believing it was some type of guardian angel. Now for our next story, it is also in response to the same post on Reddit, but this time it's by a user named RocketK69. I was in a really terrible car accident a few years ago and I was stuck in the car. They had to cut me out. During it, I came to and there was a woman who had climbed into the rear seat behind me and was holding my shoulder, telling me that I was going to be okay and that help was coming. I thought she stayed with me until I blacked out and woke up to a fireman cutting the door off and pulling me out. The firemen, paramedics, and my mother, who all had gotten there very quickly, all said there was no woman at all. The traffic had gone around and no one had stopped because the fire department was only a few blocks down the road. I can still hear her voice. I know she was touching me, but no one saw her. Freaks me out still. A user by the name of Do It For The Cats responded to this user sharing their own experience, saying, I had a very similar experience. Terrible car accident, had to be cut out, came to, and a woman was there comforting me. But she didn't sit in the car with me. She was outside the car. 20 years later, and her calming presence is still so vivid to me. The Heart Starts Pounding podcast shared the Reddit user rocketk 69 story on TikTok, where it went on to trend. Many responses to this story, just like the user Do It For The Cat, also had been in bad accidents and explain a woman was there to comfort them while they waited for help. The last story of the third man syndrome that is truly just shocking to me is from another Reddit user in the same post named WorryPie7025. This Reddit user writes, A friend and I were walking home from the clubs in Florence, Italy. We walked past an American girl walking the opposite way, her GPS blaring where to go. She seemed drunk. We walked past her, paused, and then turned around to look at her again. We turned around and there was an American man looking very fresh and clean at 4 a.m. He said, is that your friend over there? We said, no. He asked, should you go be her friend? We went to walk her home and wait at her door for her friend to buzz her up. Right next to her apartment door was a man hiding behind a parked car, exposed, jacking off the entire time we stood there. My friend and I held hands and booked it all the way home after the girl got inside safely. When we got home, we began discussing what just happened, and I said, what about that beautiful blonde man who told us to help her? He was wearing the exact outfit my dad used to wear on Sundays. She was like, blonde? No, he was Latino, like me, and was dressed like my dad. It's still the weirdest thing that ever happened to me. The third man syndrome is definitely one with a lot of stories of survival and strength, but also one full of arguments. 
Some strongly believe that this is a scientific and natural human response to trauma. Some believe these are guardian angels, and others are left wondering what type of supernatural phenomenon this is, or maybe it's both supernatural and scientific. I want to know what you, as listener of Misty Mysteries, thinks about the third man syndrome, and if you have had any experiences of your own. I also want to know what you think of Misty Mysteries and this episode, which you can do by leaving a review where you are listening to this episode right now, or by sharing on social media. I want to thank you for listening to this week, and I will see you next time with more ghostly spooks and chilling crimes.